<laughs> hey! Hi, Shanae. It just started snowing here. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> but we'll take it. So, how are you? Fine. Good. So good. Awesome. Hello, Sophianne. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you, Sine? I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Hello, Sophie Ann. How are you? Oh. Yes, something's got some echo. Yeah. Let's see. It's coming from Tommy. I'm going to meet him for a second. Um, let's see. Who else do we have? Juan, how are you? Are you there, Juan? No? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Echo cut. Alright, let's see. I am. And Maria, how are you today? Oh, no one wants to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cecilia, how are you? I am. I don't know how I look. <laughs> Oh, hello, hello. Uh, hey, Cecilia, how are you? I'm fine, but I don't know how I look because I, I had a nap after, oh. the, <laughs> after the exam that I failed in the written part. I couldn't pass even to the oral. Oh, no worries, no worries. You mm. look great. You look beautiful. No, <laughs> I'm terrible, I'm terrible. No, you look good. Matter. I I I do my best for July. I do my best for July. <laughs> well, you're doing good. And uh, is it Radic or Radic? How do I say your name? Uh, Radic. Radic, how are you today? All right, thank you. Good, good, good. And Servit, how are you? Good to see you. Haven't seen you in a while. All right, we, I know we're having major connection problems today, so all the teachers have been posting about it. So we will uh, we'll try to power through. So um, yeah, Cecilia just got cut off, and it's, it seems like people who normally don't have problems getting in or having problems. So, um, it's all right. We'll try to power through it. So, hello everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Shanae and uh, I'm from the United States. I live in California. Um, it just started snowing here. <laughs> so, um, I'm not a big fan of snow. So, uh, it'll be an indoor day today. But um, this is an advanced class, uh, so a good handle on the English language is important to understand what we're doing in here. Um, we do a lot of literary analysis. We've been working. We're we're working through. Um, Professor uh, Chine. We're working. I'm through. Tommy. Hi, Tommy. <coughs> it's uh, snowing, you say, like uh, like uh, Northern California? No, I live in Southern California. Right? Yeah, snow? I live in snow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Snow, right? <laughs> yeah, snow. Yeah, it's snowing. I can't believe it. <laughs> so, yeah, neither yeah. can we. So, um, so, anyway, so we have a lot to cover today, guys, because we got, we've, we've got a little bit um, behind last class. So, we've been working through a novel. So um, if you haven't joined this class before, you might be lost. Um, so uh, see how it goes. And if you feel like you're lost, then just hang out in the lobby and watch. And um, someone who uh, has been been in uh, the class before. No, sir, you're fine. You, you're good at English. Yeah, so I'm typewriting type like uh, before then. Uh, Professor Daniel Cross and then like uh, 
Yeah. Typewriting like a about the crude oil war and uh, I'm I'm commenting comment commenting uh, and uh, taking that in the BBC World News and the program and uh, you have to say side about and uh, I commented comment and uh, and send it on using Skype and uh, and uh, and uh, about the crude oil war and uh, making that and uh, behind the uh, world G8 people okay. nation. Yeah. All right, tell me. Okay, we're talking about something totally different in this class. So yeah, we're reading. Yeah, 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 yeah. we're reading. No, we're reading a book. Yeah. I I want to say that only that. Uh, yeah. No, 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 yeah. Different category. You know. Sorry about that. Yeah. No worries. Okay. So, um, I'm gonna need um everyone to um listen first um before we all start talking. So um anyway, so we are reading a book called Winesburg, Ohio. Um, and we're going to finish up a story um, called The Philosopher really quick. Um, I actually had homework for you guys. Um, did anybody read um, Nobody Knows? Yes. 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 Okay, yes. good. Excellent. Wonderful. So um, let's first finish up The Philosopher, then we'll briefly talk about Nobody Knows, and then for the rest of the two hours, we're going to work on the first part of godliness. So um, everybody just hang out and um, see how it goes. Um, if we could all just really quickly introduce ourselves, all I want from you today is just your name and where you're from. That's it. So um, Cecilia, would you like to start for me? Yes. Yeah. My name is Cecilia. I'm from Uruguay, a small country in South America between Argentina and Brazil. Perfect. All right. Federico? Hello, everyone. My name is Federico. I'm from Argentina, but I live in Spain. Um, that's all. Perfect. <laughs> and Juan? Hello, everybody. This is Juan from Echo. Good. And Maria? Maria. Uh oh. All right. Um. Rat. Uh. Radic. Radic. Yeah. Radic. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Radic. I'm Polish, but I'm staying in Norway. In Italy. Norway. Uh, say Norway. that again. Norway. <laughs> Norway. Oh, Norway. 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 Okay. Gotcha. Perfect, awesome. It's cold there too. <laughs> um, and uh, Servet? Hello, I'm Servet. I'm from Turkey. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and <laughs> Sofian? Hello, my name is Sofian. I'm from Algeria. Excellent. And Tomi? Hi, uh, everyone. I'm, I'm living in Tokyo Metropolitan in Japan. Excellent. All right. So um, let me give you guys um, the link to the last page of The Philosopher. We've been reading this short story about a guy named Dr. Parsival. And Dr. Parsival is one of the most um, grotesque characters in Winesburg, Ohio. We've been discussing this term of grotesque um, for uh, quite some time. And if you're unfamiliar with the term grotesque, it basically means strange in appearance or character. So the book that we're reading, uh, Winesburg, Ohio, is a collection of short stories, all of which have to do with people in this town. And um, we are reading right now about Dr. Parsifal, who is very, um, very grotesque, not only in the way he looks, but in his attitude. Um, he has been talking to the central character in the story by the name of George Willard. Um, George Willard is a young reporter in Winesburg that um, everyone in the town seems to want to talk to because he appears to be a very good listener. Mm -hmm. um, when, we, when we talk about Nobody Knows, we're going to see a little bit of George's own grotesqueness. He's not free from it either. But um, what Dr. Parsifal has been telling George is about his life. And it's very hard to tell 
um, with Dr. Parsifal if he is telling the truth or if he's lying. So there seems to be what we would say, there seems to be kernels of truth, kernels of truth, which basically means that there's little parts of truth in what he uh, talks about, but we're not really sure what the truth is and what's a lie. Um, we found out that he comes from a very uh, poor family, um, a very, what we would say, a very dysfunctional family. Um, his mother does laundry for a living. His brother is a drunk and works on the railroad. And his father um, was in an, an insane asylum. His dad's crazy. So um, he hasn't really had the best life. Um, he also, we've learned that he's a doctor in the town. Um, at one point in his life, he was going to be a minister. Um, we see that when he went to pray over his dead father, he would have been a really bad minister because um, he's just weird. Um, he calls his dad, he says, Oops. peace be, be with this carcass. And we don't usually use the word carcass to describe a dead body. That's usually a dead animal. So good thing he didn't become a minister. Um, but he's not a good doctor either. Um, we know that um, that he doesn't get a lot of patience. Um, that somehow he's still able to support himself. Um, he makes a mention that maybe he murdered someone or robbed a robbed somebody, stole a large sum of money, um, and that's how he's able to support himself. But we really don't know. Uh, and when we finished up last class, the last thing we read about was this little girl who was thrown from a buggy. Um, this book takes place uh, right after the Civil War. Um, so this is, it, it takes place a long time ago. So she was thrown from a buggy and was killed. And there's, a to there's three other doctors besides Dr. Parsifal in Winesburg who all went to see about trying to save the little girl. They obviously couldn't. But then when somebody goes to fetch Dr. Parsifal, he refuses to even go and, and try to help this little girl. But what's more compelling than that is nobody seems to care. So once again, um, we've talked about other characters in this book, um, but we once again we're faced with a character who is isolated, um, isolated in nature. Um, he doesn't have friends. He doesn't have anyone he can turn to. Um, and this is a recurring theme that we see among the people of Winesburg. You also see with Dr. Parsifal that his communication skills are lacking in the sense that they are very grotesque. Um, they are very strange. Um, it's, he's telling basically his deepest, darkest secrets to um, a man he barely knows. He barely knows George Willard. And he also, when I guess the last thing I'll mention before we get into the reading, is he suggests to George Willard uh, something that's pretty uh, it's terrible, really. He basically su suggests to him um, to be what he says is a superior being, but his idea of a superior being is someone who is filled with hatred and contempt for mankind. He models this idea of a superior being after his brother, who very clearly was not a superior, superior being. He was a drunk. He was mean to his family. He had an inability to show love and compassion. Um, and his brother ultimately died by getting drunk and getting run over because he passed out in the middle of a road. So Dr. Parsifal's philosophy on life, and that's why this story is called The Philosopher, is very grotesque. It's very strange. It's very weird. Um, it's probably the weirdest out of 
anyone will ever read about in this in this book. So that's kind of a crash course for getting everyone up to speed. Um, we're going to read the last page of this story. Um, then the next story, which I had assigned for homework, is Nobody Knows. We're going to briefly talk about that. And then we're going to start reading the first part of Godliness, which is a four-part story that I think is going to take us at least the next four classes to get through. So um, there's the link for the reading that we're going to start with now. Um, welcome. This class is really fun. We have really good conversations. Um, and this book is really weird. <laughs> so, um, if you, so if you like um, good conversation uh, with a little twist of weirdness, um, you're in the right spot. So um, Cecilia, we'll have you start out with the reading. And um, I'm on the wrong page. I was on page four, yeah. Yeah, sorry guys, I gave you guys the wrong page. Here's the right page. Uh, we're going we're gonna to start at the top of page five. So Cecilia, let me have you read the first two paragraphs. A page, next chapter. Oh my god, I want to page. Previous chapter, nobody knows. So, yeah, go, yeah, go to page five of the philosopher. Next page, three, four, five. There okay. I am. Okay. okay. <clears throat> All of these Dr. Parsival did not know, and when George Willower came to his office, he found the man shaking with terror. What I have done did uh, no did not. What have I done will arouse the people of his town, he declared excitedly. Do I know a uh, human nature? Do I do I not know what will happen? Word by my refusal will be whispered about. Presently, men will get together in groups and talk of it. They will come here. They will quarrel and there will be what of hanging. Talk of hanging. Then they will come again bearing a rope in their hands. Dr. Parsival shock with fright. I have a present presentiment, he declared emphatically. It may be that what I am talking about will not occur this morning. It may be put off until tonight, but I will be hung. Everyone will get excited. I will be hung to a lamp post on Main Street. Good. All right. So, um, what is he talking about in terms of what he has done that's going to upset the town? Not going to help the little girl? Yeah, not going to help the little girl. But he's unaware of what fact. That nobody is, cares. Yeah, he has no idea that nobody cares. Um, so he has built up in his mind that what he has done is going to is going to cause him great harm. But he is unaware of the fact that nobody cares about him, um, which is really kind of sad if you think about it. Um, now, one thing I'll say is. Would you, the, this, this, this whole conversation that he's having with George just kind of goes to show another aspect of Dr. Parsival's grotesqueness. Um, what seems to be his attitude about potentially being hanged and killed? He's afraid. Is he, though? Uh, 
it does say that he's shaking with terror. But do you he think was he, fright. you think he was frightened? He's confused, I guess. Maybe he's okay. Maybe he's confused. I think I don't know the man, but just just jumped in. But uh -huh. he looks a little bit. Uh, not sure. Maybe he thinks about he is not that weird, and he thinks everybody they they won't do something bad to him. Maybe they think like this. He thinks like this. Maybe. Okay, so that he doesn't really truly believe yes. that everyone is gonna hurt him. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like so maybe it, that he's just putting on a show, perhaps. Yes. Yeah, probably. Okay. Okay, all right. Um, John outside mentions that everybody will be excited. And he mentions, and I'm glad that you brought that up, John, because he does say this over and over again about everyone getting excited. Who does it actually seem is the one that's actually excited about all of this potentially happening? Dr. Parson. Yeah, Dr. Parsifal. It's almost like he's almost excited that he is going to be the center of attention of town, even if it's for something really bad, like getting hanged. Yeah, so um, this just kind of goes to show you um, a couple things. One, his cluelessness about his, um, his position in society. Um, but it also shows um, his his grotesqueness that he gets excited um, about really odd things, things that you and I probably wouldn't get so excited about. Um, Frederico, can you read the last two paragraphs of this for me? Mm, yes. Going to the door of his dirty office, Dr. Parsifal looked timidly down the stairway leading to the street. When he turned, the fright that he had been in, in his eyes was beginning to be replaced by doubt. Coming on tiptoe across the room, he tapped George Wheeler on the shoulder. If not now, sometime, he whispered, shaking his head. In the end, it will be crucified, uselessly crucified. Dr. Parsifal began to plead with George Wheeler. You must pay attention to me, he urged. If something happens, perhaps you will be able to write a book, to write the book that I may never get written. The idea is very simple. So simple that if you are not carefully, you will forget it. It is this, that everyone in the world is Christ and they are all crucified. That's what I want to say. Don't you forget that. Whatever happens, don't you dare let yourself forget it. Okay. This is probably one of the only smart things that this guy is saying. Um, it says that he begins to be filled with doubt. What do you think the doubt is that he's beginning to be filled with? What is he doubting? Mm -hmm. He'll be crucified. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that a little bit, Sofian? Uh, mm. <laughs> okay, so he first first yeah. it seems like he might be afraid that they're gonna come for him and kill him. But yeah. nobody seems to be showing up. So what is he now starting to fear? It has to do with the very first thing he tells George on this page. He, he couldn't get written. Maybe he, to do that. maybe he thinks uh, somebody like this George may kill him like sneakily. Like somebody uh, whose friend will kill him. Mm, no, this, okay. He started at, questioning his... Uh, knowledge of human nature. Say that again? He started questioning his, uh, his knowledge about human nature. Um, that's a little bit later. At first, 
he, okay, l listen to this. So he says, um, going to the door of his dirty office, Dr. Parsifal looked timidly down the stairway leading to the street. When he returned, the fright that had been in his eyes was beginning to be replaced by doubt. Um, coming on tiptoe across the room, he tapped George Willard on the shoulder. If not now, sometime. So what is he doubting that's going to happen? Or that, that, yeah, this is going to hunk him. Actually, he's just, gonna die. just the opposite of that. He's starting to be afraid that nobody's going to come. That nobody's going to come and hang him. Um, the reality is starting to set in for Dr. Parsifal that nobody cares about him. Um, that he he's starting to realize that nobody pays attention to him. This is why he looks at George and says, you must pay attention to me. This is a desperate plea from Dr. Parsifal to George to beg someone, anyone, yes, he, he to pay attention to, leave to him. One person, yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. And then he makes this comment about being crucified and that his philosophy is that everyone in the world is Christ and they are all crucified. What do you think he means by that? Any ideas? It's maybe he's passed as a as a minister or okay maybe okay what um does everybody do, what do we know about about G, about Jesus what do what happened to to Jesus that he came to die for our uh -huh. sins yes um historically though um that's that's definitely a, a Christian's perspective on it. But historically, he came and was killed, right? He was hung on a cross and was mm -hmm. killed. Mm -hmm. um, why? Why because was he? He, he wow. was said to be the son of God. Yes, and what was he doing around Jerusalem that upset everyone? He, he claimed that he, he proclaimed the word of God. He was oh, this, this, preaching. He sorry. was preaching. He was preaching. He also go ahead, Federico. What were you going to say about it? No, no. You talk about the 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 people of Jerusalem about, would say about when they were they were upset because they say if you are the son of God, you can uh, I don't know get, get free yourself and. Mm hmm That's true. Okay. Um, let me ask, okay, I, that's actually, that's, that's a good point. Um, let me ask you this. What, besides besides the stuff about Jesus saying that he is the son of God and, and, and all of this, claiming to be the king, yada, yada, what was a message that he preached? He came to... It's a four-letter word that starts with L. Great. Four letters. Love. 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 Yes. yes, love. Exactly. He preached love and he preached compassion. Yet, even though he preached these things, what happened to him? Crucified. He was crucified. So Dr. Parsifal's, basically his whole point about this is that even if you have the best intentions, even if you have the best intentions in life, you are doomed to be misunderstood. You are doomed to be misunderstood. That's his point about that we are all Christ and we are all crucified. That no matter, and this happens, I don't know about you, but this happens to me a lot. I'll say something to someone with the best of intentions and they will take it completely the wrong way and completely misunderstand me. This just happened like two days ago to me. And 
Um, and, it, it, and if you think about it, this probably has happened in your life at some point where you try to do something with good intentions and people misunderstand why you're doing the things that you're doing. So that is Dr. Parcival's point about that we are all Christ and we're all crucified. So if you think about it that way, if we are all doomed to be misunderstood, what kind of life will we lead? Think back to the other characters in this story, like Wing Beetlebaum and uh, Elizabeth Willard. Uh, and Doc. Go ahead, Sofiane. They have to be isolated? Yes, exactly. If we're always going to be misunderstood, what Dr. Parsival is saying is that we are all going to live a life, a, li a, life, a life of isolation and, um, and, and have the inability to communicate. Does that make sense? Yep. This is, like I said, this is probably the smartest thing that this guy has said um, <laughs> in the entire story. It's a very deep, um, a very deep philosophy that, and if you look, okay, if we go back to Wing Beetlebaum, which is the first character in Weinsberg we read about, he had very good intentions, right? He was a very good teacher. He loved his students. And he was misunderstood to be a molester and a pedophile. Elizabeth Willard has the best intentions for her son, George. But she is misunderstood as an overprotective mother who is overbearing to her son. Um, now we have Dr. Parsival, who I don't know if I quite know what his best intentions are, but it's quite obvious that he is misunderstood by the entire town all the time. Um, so again, this is, it's kind of, Dr. Parsival kind of finally, I don't know, hits the nail on the head with what is wrong with society. That we need to, basically what he's saying is that we need to be more understanding of one another. And we need to be more loving and more compassionate. So, um, that's Dr. Parsival in a nutshell <laughs> kind of so he's he's very strange but like I said every once in a while throughout the story he has he comes up with something that there's a kernel of truth to what he is saying well, maybe he, he thought this way because he knows that he, he could he could die because he, could, he thought he could die yeah. Um, yeah, that's a possibility. That's a possibility. Um, do you really think he's really fearful of the town coming to get him? I don't. I, I don't get no. that. Yeah, okay. But I don't know. He, he starts to think this way just in the moment when they maybe knew that uh, he, he could die any gotcha. time. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then you have to look at his how his life has been too, you know, with his brother and his father. You know, um, his it's it seems that he's been faced with the idea of that you can die at any time because of what he has seen happen with his family. So um, that's a good quote, Shay. The the road to hell is paved with good intentions. It's actually a really good quote. It's one of my favorites. So that's a good one. Yeah. So, um, all right. Nobody knows. Does anybody want to give us kind of a, for those of you who read it, what is this, what happens in this, in this story of nobody knows? George Willard. Yeah. George Willard. And a woman. Go out on a date with Luis. Luis Trunyan or something. Trunyan, uh huh. Yeah, Luis Trunyan. Mm hmm. Yeah. 
And what do George and Louise decide to, what, what do they do? They hang out. They do a little bit more than hang out. <laughs> well, uh, that's the first step. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That that is um, that is uh, the first step. Um, yeah. sh go ahead. No, no. I think that the, one of the the things I remember that uh, she she sent him uh, sent to him a, a letter to the to the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What does it remember? What does it say? You can you can give me you can give me when uh, something something like that. Yeah. I'm yours you, if you want me. I'm yours. Yeah. I'm yours. Yeah, that's. Yes, I'm yours if you want me. If you want me. Mm -hmm. I'm yours if you want me. And so, where does where does George go to uh to find her? Where does he find her at? Father's house. Yeah, at her father's house. At her father's house, and they decide to um. Go for a walk. Go for a walk. Mm hmm Yes. And they end up um they end up well I'll just they end up having sex. Um, which it's it's um remember that this book was published in nineteen nineteen. So they weren't written like they are written today. But in this time, this story was actually considered very pornographic. Um, even though, yeah, it was. It was considered very, very uh, pornographic. Um, but even even though it's it's not. I mean, it's not described as such. I mean, if you read stuff today, it's a lot more pornographic than this. Um, but yes, um, and. The deal with this is, I guess, what I would like for you guys to get to get out of this um, is what what is the relationship between George and Louise? What is the relationship between them? Uh, lust relationship. Yes. A sex relationship. I don't know. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. On whose part is it lustful? And George. For yes. George, yeah. For George. Yeah. Yes. For George. Um. If I'm not sure if you guys got this, but this is George's first time. He's. This is. This is where he loses his virginity. So. And it's obviously not with the woman that he's in love with. This is really just a meaningless act for him. He's just he's just getting it on. I mean, it means it really means nothing to him except having a sexual experience. Now for Louise what big deal. I say that again. This was uh, it's the opposite, just the opposite. Yeah, it is. She wants more from George. She wants love from George. Um, she wants understanding from George. Um, something that seems almost very appropriate that this story comes right after the philosopher. Because the philosopher ends with talking about people's lack of understanding for one another. And he's and to top it all off, Dr. Parsival is telling George that people have a lack of understanding for one another. He gets this note from Louise that says, You can have me if you want me. And he takes that to mean something completely different than what she intended it to mean. She did not intend for this to be a one night stand. She did not intend for this to be a meaningless sexual encounter. She was trying to communicate. And once again, here we have this whole idea 
about the grotesque inability to communicate. Louise was not able to effectively communicate to George that she wanted more from him. George didn't understand that Louise wanted more from him. So it's this, it's almost like the, the lack of understanding and the lack of effect, uh, effective communication just continues to um, spiral out of control. Um, so it's, it's, it's just, and now who does it seem that the inability to communicate and the lack of understanding is starting to affect? George Willard. George. Yeah. yeah, George. Who we've seen up until this point seems to be, um, which is what I'm looking for, um, seems to be immune. He seems to be immune from this inability to communicate and this lack of understanding. Because up until this point, he seems to be a really good listener. You know, he listens to Wing Beetlebaum. He's listened to Dr. Parsifal. Um, he spends a lot of time with his mother. He seems like a very dutiful son. And then we see a whole nother George, and nobody knows. This is a George that we haven't um, seen as of yet. And he's very insensitive. He seems very insensitive to Louise's feelings. So um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on Nobody Knows. It's, it's pretty short. I guess, like I said, the, the main thing I really want to uh, wanted you to get out of that is that these themes of isolation, inability to communicate, lack of understanding are now starting to affect our main character. They're starting to affect our hero. So um, George is really the hero thus far in this in this novel, and you know now he's almost like a fallen hero. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so now now he's uh, you know he's starting to change a little bit. You know he's he's not the same same George. So um, one other thing about this story is it mentions a lot of scenery um, and a lot of other uh, other characters in Winesburg that we're really not going to see a lot of but yeah so does anybody have any questions about nobody knows or anything that we've been discussing this far or any comments anything that you think would be helpful to add I feel like I'm lecturing a lot this class <laughs> which it happens but Shay says he thinks the main character is hardly a hero why Shay Imagine how the hero doesn't need making a hero, and uh, it's about the, the sacrifice bravery, like um, wrote down and uh, every part of the propaganda using about. Say that again, Tommy. Uh, about uh, hero is uh, <clears throat> creating propaganda and uh, mm. sacrifice and uh, and uh, making the that hero me meaning about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, heroes. Heroes do. Uh, you said heroes sacrifice a lot. You know, to to accomplish their goal. Yes, it does not seem that George is willing to sacrifice much of anything. So I would agree with you there. I would definitely agree with you there. Mm -hmm. So, um, does anybody else have anything they'd like to add about this? I think what? I think that he. So sorry, sir. Go 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 ahead. So, what is the relationship between this fallen hero and Doctor? And Doctor Parsifal? Yes. They're just acquaintances. They barely know each other. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yep. They barely know each other. I'm not. I can't spell. Why does it when Friday comes around, I all of a sudden can't spell? Um. <laughs> so, um. 
Nasser says that he thinks the the doctor inherited some character from his father. Um, do you mean Doctor Parsival is insane? I th I think that he collects the words from each pers each character that we read before. Uh, George or Doctor Parsival? George. George. Yeah, it does. It seems like the bad things from each person seems to stick on him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You have to think about this too, though. I mean, if you were George and um, you were surrounded by all these really grotesque people and you're growing up in an environment like that, do you think it would be hard to not fall into that? No, I think that it's normal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like he would have to move away, you know, like like we talked about in Mother, in the story of Mother, that, um, you know, it almost seems like he needs to get out of Winesburg to escape, escape the grotesqueness. So, I live, I, I've mentioned this before, I live in a small town, and um, there's a lot of grotesques here. Um, there's, you know, there's people here that, remind me a lot of a lot of these characters um, in terms of their um, their outlook on life is, is strange. The way they conduct their life is strange. Their moral oh. their moral compass wavers yeah, and how they act. Yes, exactly. So um, you know everybody talks about everybody. Um, it's I live in the, I live in a very strange place. <laughs> In a hell. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, even the name, even the name of where I live is is weird. I live in a place called Yucaipa. So. <laughs> it seems, uh, seems like a, a Mexican city. It's an Indian name, actually. Indian. Yeah, yeah, it's Native American. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, and the the places around here, there's really um, there's really four small towns that just kind of you know back up into each other. Yucaipa, Calamesa, um, Beaumont, and uh, Banning is kind of the area that I live in. And those four small towns, um, it's a trip. Like, Beaumont and Banning, like, they hate each other. They can't stand each other. It's so mm -hmm. weird. So, um, I, I, I'm not from here, though. I can at least say I'm an implant. I am I am not from here. <laughs> so, I'm from Tucson, Arizona. So at least I can say that I was not... I, I, I don't drink uh, Arizona tea. <laughs> I, get, I get really freaked out by the people that say they were born and raised here and have never left. I'm always like, wow, that's, <laughs> that's weird. Poor, poor you. I need... I I, I must be drinking about the Arizona red tea. <laughs> <laughs> so can, all right. can, can tea, uh, pet bo plastic bottle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah all it's right. Very comfortable, maybe. Well, let's start reading um let's start reading godliness. Um and this is another strange story. Um, I'm a stranger, strange story and a stranger and I'm talking like a yeah. <laughs> strange stranger and a plus alpha. Like a <laughs> so we're going to, we're going to start reading, um, we're going to start reading, uh, godliness. And like I said, it's, it's a story in four parts. And this first part, uh, talks about the page. Does anybody know what the word patriarch means? Patriarch. 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 Yeah, patriarch is like the head of a family, the male male head of a family. So, um, uh, it's about the. Uh, I, I think about the. Uh, I want to say that in a patriarchism role in, a, in the U.S. side. Patriarch? Yeah, well, I mean, it's just all patriarch means is it's the head of a family, so uh, the male like, head of a family. Yeah. But, so. but, 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 uh, not it's freedom, freedom like, like the uh, old, right? I say that people again, one? Like, uh, people, 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 uh, okay. the older male in the family. 
Say it one uh, more time. Uh, most of the times is the all male of the family. Yes, exactly, exactly. And that's who we're going to be reading it out today. All the style I understand, but in a, now the patriotism role in a, if in a, talking in a government side and then opportunity talking in a, like a, you spy or something to the like a US side, right? Um, yeah, that is not the freedom. Like, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's about yeah. The, not the American dream. <laughs> but you you cannot call your father patriot, no. Yeah, well, I mean, no, it's, it's not an what old you would call. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, it's old fashioned. So, okay. yeah. um, but all right, so we're gonna start because this is kind of long. So yeah. we're going to start reading this, um, and it's on Jesse Bentley, like good. And um, this guy is, is also quite grotesque. Um, Juan, let's have you read the first two paragraphs for us. Okay. There were always three or four old people sitting on the front of the porch of the house or pottering about the garden of the barn. Three of the old people were women and sisters to yeast. They were a colorless sub voice lot. Then there was a silent old woman with thin white hair who was Jesse's uncle. The farmhouse was built of wood, a board old odor covering or fine work of logs. It was really in reality not one house but a cluster of houses joining together in a rather haphazard manner. Inside, the place was full of surprises. One went up steps towards the living, living houses. To the, yeah, you sound like a robot, one. <laughs> okay. I, I'm going to try not to sound like a robot. It's okay. it's your connection. It's just your connection. Your connection's making okay. you sound like a robot. Yeah. May I tune? Yeah, keep going. Now that's better. There were four men. I want to mean I'll call it Billy, who was in charge of the housekeeping, a girl with a girl named Elisa Stockton, who oh. made it and helped Wait. with. Yeah. Where are you at? Sorry, what you said? Oh, um, start with one went up the steps from the living room. Who worked yeah. instead of just work himself to honor an overload of three four. That's it? No, no, I didn't hear you read the second par the second paragraph. Okay, one went up steps. Yeah, there we go. The steps from the living room into the dining room, and there were always steps to ascent of the sand in passing from one room to another. At least times he place was like a behe behave. Behave. Uh huh. At one moment, behave. At one moment, all was quiet. Then doors began to open. Feet. Catered on a search, a murmur of soft voice arose, and people appeared from a dozen of school corners. Good. Okay. So, um, where does this story take place? Where are we at? Jess's farm. Jess's farm. Oh, at the farm. Yeah, B Bentley Farm. Yes, Sorry. the Bentley Farm. Yes, we're at the Bentley Farm. And who. It, it, there's always how many people on the front porch? Three, four. Three or four. Three of them are who? Were women. Were women. And sisters uh -huh. to Jess. Uh -huh. To Jesse. Uh huh. Jesse. Yes. Jesse. And then who's the fourth? Jesse's uncle. Jesse's uncle. Jesse's uncle. Is Jesse's uncle a young man, an old man? An old man. An old man, yeah, yeah. So, um, and they live in a farmhouse, but is it just one house? 
No, yeah. no, no, no. A cluster of houses. Right, yeah. Yes, it's a cluster of houses. And um, during mealtime, what is this place like? Beehive. Beehive. Yeah, a beehive, which means what? What is... I think what maybe way? because it's cluster of uh, houses, everybody no. is walking around, maybe yeah, because yeah, they say the four steps are ascending and descending, somebody is walking around right. uh, it, continuously. Yeah, it mainly is because there is a bunch of, of, of activity. Yeah, okay. all, the, all the people that live there are, are like a bunch of bees because they're moving around really quickly and there's always, at a farm, do you think life is dull on a farm or do you think that there's a lot of work to be done? Of course, there are lots of work to be done. Yeah, there's always lots of work to be done. So this expression of it being like a beehive is that there's people going, you know, moving around really quickly. John says murmurs. Yeah, people are probably talking to one another. So uh -huh. it sounds like buzzing. You know, people are talking. People are moving around, um, especially during what time? Meal time. Midtime. Meal times, yes, absolutely. It's not a quiet place. Yes, absolutely. So, um, okay, guys, I'm gonna let everyone take about a four minute break, and then we'll come back for um, part two of this. Um, here's the link for you guys. So I gotta go get into that hangout, and I will see you guys shortly. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. And we'll continue. Yeah. We'll continue bye. this in four Hope minutes. Okay. All right. Bye. bye guys. Bye. 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 Thank you, people. Thank you. Take care too. See you.